Good evening. I am very happy to see you all here. I'm very grateful for the invitation. And I'll be more grateful if the PowerPoint comes on. Hey, hey. That's a good start. Appreciate getting to come a little bit early and spend some time with Andy and Marsha, and I'm very pleased that my, my wife could be with me this evening. Uh, I know she has been on your prayer list for some time and at, at different times and different things, and so she's not always able to be with me, but tonight she is, and so I will be on my best behavior as we look about some things concerning the animals on Noah's Ark. This might be kind of misleading the animals because this lesson is going to focus primarily on the dinosaurs. And so I know that uh, here in the past decade or maybe a little bit longer the dinosaurs have really taken a hold and uh, I know when I was a kid yeah, we we was more into Sergeant Rock and G.I. Joe and those kinds of things. But dinosaurs have really taken up, and, and it's probably a good thing because Andy and I were discussing earlier this uh, apologetics press has done a wonderful job putting these lessons together, and they really took a lot of the work out of it for me uh, But because I learned a lot studying and preparing for this this lesson and uh, it helped me to consider some things that I had not considered at length before and I appreciate that very much but it's so it's such a dawning thing in the world today to discuss or to have a a, a rational and logical conversation with somebody about the Bible or biblical matters because there are so many people in the world today who are just so quick to dismiss the Bible or anything of a biblical nature. When I was a, a boy in the 70s growing up in Newport, Ohio, everybody in my town believed in God and believed the Bible was the Word of God. We, we it was Atheists and agnostics were somebody from somewhere else. They weren't in the Ohio Valley. And so we could begin preaching like Peter did on the day of Pentecost. We could start preaching with the gospel, plan of salvation, and we could quote the Bible and, and people took it. But nowadays, with the, with the rise of skepticism and agnosticism and atheism, we're going to have to start preaching a little more like Paul did in Athens. We're going to have to start proclaiming the unknown God that Paul did so very well in, in, in Athens that we read about in Acts 17. So the climate has shifted some. Not everybody can just, uh, you can just assume not everybody doesn't believe the Bible or considers the Bible to be a legitimate thing. And what we're going to study about this evening is designed to equip us as believers to have a rational and educated discussion with the skeptics who want to know, who think they can trick us by saying, well, what about the dinosaurs? And, uh, and we'll get into some of these things and I'll try to point some of these things out to you as we go along. For us who are Bible believers, there's not too many of us who would question God's miraculous ability to create the animals. If we turn in our Bibles to day six of creation, and we see that God created the, the flying animals and the sea or the, uh, the land inhabiting animals, and uh, we see how that God caused the animals to come to Noah and different things. And we, we can see the logic of when it, when it comes time for Noah to enter the scene and, and to collect these animals. He took two of each kind of animal 
on the ark for repopulation purposes. God caused the animals to come to Noah. We read that as Bible believers and we, we accept it. We can even see the logic behind him bringing seven pairs of the unclean animals, or of the clean animals rather, for food, for sacrifices and those kinds of things. We don't really don't question the reason behind that. We understand that and we believe it. We don't really have a problem when we think about the different kinds and species of animals that Noah had on the ark. From dogs and cats maybe to horses to deer, snakes, the dreaded mosquitoes, <laughs> and even the bigger animals on the ark like rhinos and elephants and giraffes. We can believe that. And even when we think about some of the animals that we know existed at one time but are now extinct, like dodo birds and saber-toothed tigers and, and woolly mammoths, yeah, I'm sure they were on the ark. They're, they're extinct now. And, and we say, yeah, that's, that's all well and good. All these things were on the ark. Well, this thing's not working for me now. There it goes. It's mighty slow. <laughs> so we see the animals going to the ark, and we see lions and gazelles and the sheep maybe and giraffes and elephants, and we understand that and we agree with all that. But on the extreme lower right corner of the picture, what are those? Dinosaurs. You mean there were dinosaurs on the ark? And we go, wait a minute. That can't be the case. You've got to be crazy if you think dinosaurs were on the ark. So what about the dinosaurs? Where do they fit in these creation and flood accounts? We know that the standard evolutionary theory, which we've all been taught, tells us that the dinosaurs went extinct 60 million years ago. 60 million years ago. It's often, it's often called the theory of evolution. It's not really a theory. It's, it's, it's a hypothesis. It's a hypothesis of evolution. It doesn't rise to the standard of a valid theory. So if dinosaurs supposedly went extinct 60 million years ago, well before Noah, well before even mankind. Mankind is a Johnny-come-lately only having arrived on the scene a mere two million years ago. So where do these fit in to the hypothesis of evolution? Now, admittedly, we will not find the word dinosaur in most English Bibles. I don't, I've, I've seen and consulted about 20 different English translations of the Bible. And I didn't find a one that had the word dinosaur in it. However, this does not negate the fact that dinosaurs once cohabited the earth with mankind. And I want to explain why. Now, we have to keep in mind that, first of all, that the Bible is not a biology textbook. Okay? Now, the things that the Bible says about biology are accurate. The Bible is not an archaeological textbook. But 
the archaeological things of the Bible are accurate. Geography, mathematics, and so forth. The Bible's main purpose is to tell you and me about the God of heaven and what to do to be saved. Revelation 19.10 tells us that, the spirit of, that Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. And so he is from cover to cover. But the Bible is accurate when it talks about these things. The Bible mentions a variety of of animals in it. You've, you've read through the Bible, maybe you've even seen some Bible uh, help books that talk about animals and different things. And there are a lot of animals mentioned in the Bible, but not every animal is mentioned in the Bible. We don't see uh, cats mentioned in the Bible. We don't see kangaroos mentioned in the Bible, or elephants, or aardvarks, or anteaters or rhinos or platypus or penguins they're just not mentioned but you know and I know that they have lived at the same time man has lived to say these animals do not cohabit the earth with us because they're not mentioned in the Bible is absurd and so to assume that dinosaurs did not live at the same time as man just because they're not mentioned in the Bible is just as absurd. And I'm really trying to get this clicker to work. <laughs> we have to recognize a certain timeline. We got cat fans in the audience. The cat says, Main, because the Bible doesn't mention me, I don't exist. We could all hope, right? <laughs> That's all right. You can see me afterwards. Uh, we have to recognize an important timeline. I want you to pay special attention to this. The Bible was complete. In other words, the original autographs of the Bible were complete about 1900 years ago. Okay? Do a little math. The Bible was translated fully into English in 1535. That's 487 years ago. The English word dinosaur was not coined until 1842, a mere 180 years ago. So, why do we not see the English word dinosaur in the Bible? Because the Bible was written before the English word dinosaur was invented. Okay? So how could it be there? Incidentally, the word dinosaur means fearfully great lizard or reptile. So obviously, we wouldn't expect to find a word that did not exist in the Bible. That's why it's not there. Third, modern translations have omitted the term dinosaur from these translations and that fact does not mean however that <laughs> the Bible writers refrain from mentioning dinosaurs with a different word or with a different description perhaps. And we want to get some evidence here that dinosaurs and man lived at the same time. In contrast to what evolutionists teach, we want to consider three lines of evidence that point to a time when humans and dinosaurs once lived together, not millions of years ago, but thousands. Okay. First of all, we want to take a look at the Bible itself. Now, again, most English translations do not have the word dinosaur in them. But this does not mean that the writers of Scripture do not mention these fascinating creatures. Consider a few points from God's Word. The creation account. The Bible says that God made all land animals on the sixth 
day of creation, okay? In, uh, and it, on the sixth day of creation, all these animals came around. What else came on the sixth day? Man. So, Adam lived on the earth with every animal that was created. Dinosaur is an animal. Therefore, Adam lived with dinosaurs. You can't get over it. You can't get by it. You can't get around it. You can't get under it. It's, it had to be. There are no land animals that were not created on day six. And Moses writes in Exodus 20 and verse 11, In six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, including all the various kinds of animals. No land animals that were not created on the sixth day. Adam was created on the sixth day. Adam was there with them all. Now, to the Christian who believes this, based on the evidence that we have in the Bible, the question of whether or not man and dinosaurs lived together is a moot point. They had to have lived together. It just can't be any other way. What about if, if, we, have, if we look at the book of Job, especially Job chapter 40, we see this creature described in verse uh, 17. It says, he moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. His bones are like beams of bronze. His ribs like bars of iron. He is the first of the ways of God. Only he who made him can bring him near. Surely the mountains yield food for him, and all the beasts of the field play there. He lies under the lotus tree in a covert of reeds and, and marsh, and the lotus tree covers him with their shadow. The willows by the brook surround him. Indeed, the river may rage, yet he is not disturbed. He is confident, though the Jordan gushes into his mouth, though he takes it in his eyes, or one pierce his nose with a snare. The behemoth was not phased. Then, in chapter 41, beginning in verse 1, we read of this dinosaur-like sea-dwelling reptile called Leviathan. Can you draw out Leviathan with a hook? The implied answer was no. Or snare his tongue with a line which you lower? Can you put a reed through his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Again, the expected answer was no. He's too massive. He's too stout. He's too strong. He's too tough. We can't do that. The description in the Bible of both the Leviathan and the behemoth do not fit any other animal that is alive today or any of the animals that we know that are extinct uh, from other sources. It must be some type of dinosaur that was on the earth. And again, it wasn't millions of years ago, but it was a few thousand when, when Job was still alive. We look at history. Secondly, dinosaurs and humans once lived at the same time. I think we're, we're, we're pretty close to establishing that if we haven't already. Is it not then logical to assume that people at that time had stories or tales about these great creatures that they've seen and witnessed? Do people tell stories and, and pass them down for generations and years? In the early 70s, late 60s, my dad was a millwright and he was working on the Willow Island Lock and Dam. And they had some divers that were working there. And so the divers would have to go down in the river at the lock gates. 
And a couple of the divers came back to the surface and they said, we are not going back down there. And they said, well, why not? And they said, well, there are some catfish that are swimming down there that are as big as we are. And they refused to go down. Now that was, say that was 1972. Here it is 50 years later and I just told you the story. I've told my daughter that story. And so when she's 75 and she's telling that story, that'll be 100 years that story has been told. Okay? Same thing, people don't change that much. These people a couple thousand years ago, they had these stories that they told about these massive animals that lived on the earth. And they're still around. The stories. Now, is it possible that some of these stories may have been embellished? Some? It's probably likely that they've been enhanced, you know. That 130 pound deer you shot in the woods was 175 pounds by the time you got it to the truck, wasn't it? <laughs> that 10 inch smallmouth you caught. It was 14 and a half inches by the time you got it in the bait bucket or the back of the boat or whatever. So, things happen. But you know, the, the funny thing is, and this thing's not working so I'm going to have to give up. Um, they didn't call them dinosaurs in a lot of these stories because again that word wasn't didn't come on the scene until mid 1800s so what did they call these things nope they were called dragons now you start thinking back of all the stories you've heard about dragons and it starts making a little more sense but just because that little fish, that 10 inch fish you caught, it, it started, it, you started telling it as 14 and a half inches, the fish was still real. <laughs> it just wasn't as big as you said it was. That 130 pound deer that you said was 175 pounds by the time you got it back to the truck, it was still a real deer. It just wasn't as big as you said it was. Now, these dragons or whatever, No good. <laughs> um, maybe it needs batteries. Anyway. Uh, these dragon stories, they could be real. They could be talking about a real thing. It's working now. So why... Uh, why would we just assume that something is totally false just because somebody somewhere along the line embellished it a little bit? That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't mean dragons never lived or what these people were calling dragons. So, any honest person who reads the various dragon legend has to admit that reptiles with long necks and scaly skin and horned heads and stout legs and these massive tails sounds like a dinosaur. And we have these dragon, dragon legends about these flying animals with massive tails and gigantic wingspans and on one instance in, in Job 41 verses 18 to 21 listen to this his sneezings flash forth light and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning out of his mouth go burning lights sparks of fire shoot out smoke goes out of his nostrils as from a boiling pot and burning rushes 
fire-breathing dragons? <laughs> it's History seems to be backing up what the Bible says. Humans and dinosaurs once lived together. In 2003, this little guy was excavated in South Dakota. This long, knobby, spiky skull was found. And it was so similar to descriptions and paintings and, and carvings of so-called dragons that they actually named this thing Dracorex, which means uh, dragon king. And this is what he looks like. He's in a museum out in Indianapolis, Indiana. And they said, and I quote, a new type of dinosaur that looks like a dragon. What prompted them to say that? They, they went on to say, quote, When we saw this creature's head, we weren't sure what kind of a dinosaur it was. With spiky horns and bumps and a long muzzle, it looked more like a dragon. <laughs> Maybe that's because it was a dragon. It seems, if we, if we take all the all what we've talked about so far that the word dinosaur and the word dragon are just two different words for the same creature. It is very, very possible and likely. It's just a, it's a wonderful thing. Let's look at the physical evidence for a moment. Similar to how you and I take pictures of things. Except for young girls, they just take pictures of themselves, right? Okay. They didn't do that back in the day, right? They they didn't take pictures of themselves so much. They didn't take pictures at all. But if they saw this big creature, man, this thing come through the woods or the jungle and it looked like it was just massive. And somebody says, yeah, I remember what it looked like. And he starts scratching on the cave wall or on the wall of a building or a house or something. And so these drawings and these carvings have been discovered. And it gives credence to these things. We have in, uh, in Cambodia, there's approximately a 900-year-old carving of what appears to be a stegosaurus. Um, and this was centuries before learning about dinosaurs from the fossil record. And, and carvings like this one uh, have been found in castles in Europe. I thought that was interesting. There is the Ica stones of Peru in South America and these are uh, ancient burial stones and they've a bunch of them have been found with carvings of dinosaurs on them. In fact in 1960 in the town of Ica in Peru this guy was found, he was selling them. He didn't know what he was what he had, and, and the archaeologists went gaga over these things. And then in southeastern Utah, the Apatosaurus. Uh, rock drawings, uh, carvings that have been found, you know, right here in North America. So it's, there's, there's plenty of evidence that the ancients saw these things or heard them described in some way. Now, here's a, an interesting fact too. Scientists have discovered some dinosaur bones, and this is important, that were not completely fossilized. They were actually able to identify fragments of proteins from the dinosaur bones called collagens and elastin. And after using some chemicals to dissolve away the, the minerals, scientists have found what appeared to be a network of cells amongst this soft tissue from the dinosaur bones. That was fascinating to me. Now, scientists will tell you that proteins decay at a very rapid rate. 
surely they would have decayed within the last 60 million years, wouldn't they? Unless they're only a couple thousand years old. Still the evolutionist says, well that's controversial information. Like a lot of other controversial information, like men are always men and women are always women. <laughs> Ranks right up there. The physical and historical evidence, along with scripture, clearly testifies that man and dinosaurs lived together and that the evolutionary hypothesis is very, very flawed. So, the next question is, are we saying there were dinosaurs on the ark? That may seem a stretch to somebody. The only dry area on the face of the earth during the flood was on Noah's ark. There were representatives of all the animals on the ark. There had to have been dinosaurs on the ark. So the question then is, wait a minute. Some of these dinosaurs were 120 feet long, weighing as much as 110 tons. How could you get two of them on the ark? Well, let's think about this for a minute. Think about this first. Who was in charge of everything? God. God knows the animals. God knows... He knew how big the ark had to be, 300 by 50 by 30. Incidentally, that is still the ratio for shipbuilding used today. What if, what if we take into consideration that not every species of dinosaur was 120 feet long and weighing 110 tons? Did you know that the average size of the dinosaurs was about the size of the American buffalo? Some dinosaurs were no larger than our domestic chickens. Third, God may have allowed Noah to take baby dinosaurs on the ark. Did you ever consider that? Honestly, I had not. But it makes perfect sense. Is it barely possible that God had Noah put baby elephants on the ark? That would certainly... <laughs> Get, he would certainly get the best economy out of his space then, wouldn't he? Plus, that would greatly reduce the amount of food that he had to take on the ark to feed them all. So now we've got all these baby dinosaurs on the ark. I mean, infant dinosaurs would take up no more room than your common house dog. Okay, John, so if there are dinosaurs on the ark and God saved some of them, what happened to them? Why aren't they here? Well, the first thing we might consider is a change in the environment. We know there was a significant change in the environment after the flood. What is one of the things that indicate that? Prior to the flood, we read of people in the Bible living to be 700, 800, 900 years old. In fact, the grandfather of Noah, Methuselah, was 969 years old. After the flood, however, poor old Abraham died at a mere youth at 175. That's pretty old to us. Right, Cliff? Okay. But compared to Methuselah and them, that was a greatly reduced lifespan. So whatever changed the lifespan of humans 
may have led to the extinction of the dinosaurs. That's a possibility. Another possibility is they could have been hunted into extinction. I'm going backwards now. Finally got the thing working and I'm going the wrong way. They could have been hunted into extinction. A lot of animals have been hunted to near extinction. How much time do we have? Ten minutes. Uh, it was after the flood that God said to Noah in Genesis 9, 2, and 3, The fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the air and on all that move on the earth and all fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things even as the green herbs. So it was not until after the flood that mighty hunters like Nimrod came along and started hunting. It is possible that the dinosaurs, for whatever reason, were hunted into extinction. And they're gone. If all dinosaurs really are extinct, have you ever taken a good look at a rhinoceros? or a crocodile, or a Komodo dragon. Those could be the descendants of the dinosaurs, in my opinion. The worldwide flood recorded in Genesis 6 through 8 undoubtedly, I think, and adequately explains the presence of the massive dinosaur fossil beds that we've found across the globe. We know they existed. That's not a question. The big question for the for the science or for the evolutionary scientists is when did they exist? He says they stopped existing 60 million years ago. I was in Glen Rose, Texas back in the 1990s sometime, I don't remember what year. Down in Glen Rose, Texas, in some of the uh, areas around the Brazos River. It's called the home of the dinosaurs and there is a dinosaur track fossilized. And if I'm not mistaken there was a human footprint fossilized in it. So the human was there <laughs> right I mean, at the same time a dinosaur was because it had to have been covered up and fossilized. They were fossilized together. Why the last dinosaurs died off, if they actually did, uh, the, 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 the famous dinosaurs, I don't know. But here's what we do know. Not all of our questions are going to be answered. It doesn't happen. The Bible gives us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Okay? The Bible gives us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Second Peter, Second Peter 1 3. It gives us everything that you and I need to be truly furnished unto every good work. Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Deuteronomy 29, 29 tells us that the secret things belong to Jehovah our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. The Bible tells us what we need so that you and I can go to heaven, so that we can be equipped to do what we need to do here and now. God does not and will not ask us to do the impossible. Okay? He's not going to ask us to believe something that's impossible to believe. He's not going to ask us to teach something that's impossible to teach. He's not going to ask us to believe and teach something that has no bearing. We have an adequate 
a logical and a very reasonable explanation for all the animals, for human being and cohabitation with them. Some of the things that God asks us to do are not easy, but they're not impossible. If we will get busy doing our part, we can rest assured that we are equipped to do our part because God will have already done his part. And he has. He's done everything that we could ever hope to ask for. Remember in Genesis 6.20, God did not have to, or Noah rather, did not have to track down the animals and, and gather all the various animals on the ark. God caused them to come to him. There are times in our lives when we've done all that we can do in terms of our obedience and faith to him and we simply have to turn it over to him. I heard somebody say this one time, somebody smarter than me, obviously. But we need to pray like everything depends on God and work like everything depends on us. And I think that's accurate. I believe it's within the bounds of Scripture. Someday we're going to rest from our labors. Some people are thinking they're going to someday rest from their rest. We need to be busy in the work of God. Sometimes it's tempting to take God out of the equation. But it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And he's done what he is going to do for us. And we need to trust him and rely on him. We need to pray, be a praying people. And a people that will put their faith in God. Is it going to keep me out of hell if I don't, or is it going to keep me out of heaven, rather, if I don't know what happened to the dinosaurs? No. But these are just some things that help us explain why we have faith in God. And, and it serves to, to, to validate, in some way, our faith in inspired scripture. This is the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. And we can, you can not only take it to the bank, you can take it to heaven. Because that's where it'll get you. It'll get you where you're going. But you have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the living God, the true and living God. You have to believe in him. Jesus said, if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. John 8, 24. You have to repent of your sins. That's not mean, it doesn't mean you're sorry you got caught. That means you're sorry and you want to change. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, I tell you nay, but unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. The next we have to confess the Lord Jesus. Oh, I believe Jesus lives. Well, you have to confess him with your lips. Matthew 10, 32. But we also have to confess him with our lives. The way we live. And Jesus told his disciples in Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth and is baptized. That little word and, it's a very important word. It's a conjunction. It gives equal weight to belief and baptism. That's just, just like a plus sign. And two plus two equals four. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. What if I believe, but I don't want to be baptized? Well, then you don't really believe. It, it does no more good than being uh, 
baptized without believing or believing without baptism. It still equals lost. Not being unkind, I'm just telling you how it is. Why do we need to be baptized? For the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. To have your sins washed away, Acts 22.16. So you can have a good conscience before God, 2 Peter 3.21. The Pharisees rejected the baptism. And, they, and, and the Bible says they rejected God. It was John's baptism, but still, rejection of baptism is rejection of God. It's just that simple. If you are a child of God, but maybe you've been out of service a little bit. Maybe you've gone back into the ways of the world a little bit. Maybe you've, you're struggling with something. The, the sin that does so easily beset you. Whatever it might be. Maybe you just need some strength. We'd like to pray with you and pray for you or, or study if we need to. But if you're not a child of God, but you would like to go to heaven, then you have to become a child of God. And the only way to do that, the only way the Bible knows, is to hear the gospel. Believe in Jesus, repent of your sins, confess his name, and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins, and be faithful unto death to receive the crown of life. Let's go to heaven, and let's take as many with us as we can. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, would you come now as we stand and sing, please?